back. Class, it is so good to see you again. I've missed all of you. That week away was treacherous. I'm so glad that there are fights this weekend. I didn't know what to do with myself. So here we are. We're back to break down UFC Sao Paulo. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm glad you found the channel. And if you are a returning viewer, welcome back. Like I said, I've missed you. Let's jump right into the breakdowns. We'll cover everything else later. All right, See moving you right on into it, we have Kawe Fernandez taking on Mark DeCasey, and this is in the lightweight division. DeCasey is two and three in the last five fights. We got four and one on the Fernandez side. All right, so let's start on the DeCasey side. We're familiar with him. He's been in the UFC for quite a while now. He's got solid striking, right? He's got good striking speed, good footwork. His kicks are probably his best weapon on the feet. He can throw the hands, but his kicks are the best weapon on the feet. The inconsistent volume is something that he struggles with. In fights that he's able to get the volume going on the feet, he can strike very well. In fights that he just kind of doesn't throw much volume, he ends up getting outstruck by guys that have probably less technical skill than him. Now, in the wrestling, it's something he's added recently to his game, and he's done a good job with it. His takedowns benefit from the fact that he is a good striker, so the fact that he has the, these striking abilities get his opponents concerned about the strikes so he can get that takedown. When he does get on top, he does have pretty good top control, but he's not so good off his back. If he ends up on his back, he's kind of just stuck there, right? Uh, on the other side, Fernandez, good striking as well. He's got good movement. He just kind of darts in and out, landing his shots. Um, he's got very good kicks, and there's no tell on these things. He sets these things up by, you know, with, first off, making you not see them coming because he just snaps them up. But also, coming up with the hands, things like that, he can get, he can get these kicks up there from ranges that are much closer than you'd expect. Snaps them to all levels, legs, body, and head, and he just puts them there like lightning. So his kicks are his best weapon on the feet, much like DKC, but just a little bit different style of kicks, right? Uh, in the grappling, I think he's actually solid here because when he gets on top, he works to advance position immediately. He's got very good top pressure. He's good in the scrambles, and he just stays active on top, whether it's looking for ground and pound, looking to pass, looking to get for, go for a submission. The one thing I kind of both like and don't like is when he's on his back and guard, He's typically just looking for arm bars exclusively, just spamming arm bar attempts. And I don't like that because A, well, if you don't get the arm bar attempt, you're right back to where you were because he doesn't use it to pat or to sweep. He doesn't use it to create space and then get back to his feet. Nothing like that to scramble, create a scramble. He doesn't do that. He just keeps looking for the arm bar. And if he fails, he goes right back to guard and starts looking for the arm bar again. I would like to see him start to try to get back up to his feet or get to a top position, something like that. Uh, when he's on top, he does good work though. So the odds now are pretty close. They're even. So I could see why people are on the DeCasey side. I happen to get in a little bit earlier. I'm on the Fernandez side. I think he's, you know, I think he's going to be able to do well enough on the feet. And I think on the mat, he's actually going to be the more skilled grappler. And I think on the feet, it is close. So for me, I'm going to take Fernandez. I think he's, he's probably a little bit, just a little bit better in the grappling. And I think that's where the edge is going to come from. So Fernandez is my pick. Let me know who you have in the comments below. And the women's you. straw weights here. We have Montserrat Ruiz. She's taking on Eduardo Mora. Now, this is an interesting one because Mora, we don't know much about her. She's coming in 9-0, undefeated, obviously 5-0 in her last five. But there's just not a lot of footage out there. Obviously, we saw the Contender Series matchup, which really went her way the whole, the whole short bit it was around. But uh, there wasn't, there's not much else, right? You can find like one of her, uh, pro fights before that. And I think maybe an amateur fight, not entirely sure, but either way, that's what we've got on Mora. There's not a lot. I'm going to break it down in a second for Ruiz. She's two and three in her last five. It's not the best look. She's going to be undersized here. She's only five foot one with a 61 inch reach and five, six with a 67 inch reach for Mora. So Mora has all the physical advantages here. She has the momentum coming in. Let's see, how, how do her skills stack up? Well, we don't really know. We're going to go off of what we do know. We do know she has good grappling, and she wastes zero time going for the takedown. Once she gets the takedown, she's got good control once she gets on top and starts looking for that finish. That's what we know about Mora. What do we know about Ruiz? She's got decent wrestling. She likes to go, that, go to that head and arm throw, and when she does get someone down, rather than go for the submissions from that scarf position that she kind of ends up in, um, she just kind of goes for the ground and pound. And she's got good ground and pound from there. I mean, the volume is there but she doesn't really have a lot of finishing upside from that position. In the striking, she basically just strikes and flurries in order to get in close and go for that head and arm, but her striking defense is abysmal. So you got to go Mora. I think she gets it done inside the distance, and Ed Eduardo Mora is the pick, but like I understand that for Eduardo Mora, we just don't know a lot. So 
Eh, take that for what you will. I'm taking more as the pick. Let me know who you have. And we'll see we have a time. matchup that is really divided a lot of people on this one. We have Angela Hill taking on Denise Gomes in the strawweight division. Like I said, this is divided a lot of people on Twitter. And like I said earlier, we're going to talk about the other stuff. You can find me on Twitter, 138MMA. Go ahead and hit the follow button on there. Uh, or X, I guess, is what it's called now. It's still Twitter.com. Either way, find me there. You can follow me. Let's break down this fight. Okay, so for Denise Gomes, she's only 23 years old, whereas Angela Hill is 38. So there's a big, big age gap. That is important to take in, in, into account because Angela Hill at some point is going to start to decline. Maybe we've already seen it, maybe just a little. It's, you know, she's not falling off a cliff, but she's it's slightly declining, right? Gomes, she should be improving every single fight. She's 23 years old. She's like a sponge in there, absorbing new stuff, a new, a new uh, skills, uh, abilities, things like that. Uh, she's four and one in her last five, so she's riding a wave of momentum as well. Whereas Angela Hill is two and three, although that is against some of the highest level of competition in the strawweight division, two and three is not a lot of momentum. So for Hill, coming off of a loss to Mackenzie Dern, where she got her face beat in horribly, you know, it is what it is, right? So in this one here, though, let's break it down a little bit more. Let's get into the nuts and bolts, shall we? Uh, Denise Gomes, good striking, good forward pressure. Her striking defense leaves a ton to be desired, and for Angela Hill, who is a solid striker herself, we'll cover that in a second, she's going to get hit in this fight. Unless she just goes out there and lands one big shot, which she's more than capable of doing, she's probably going to get hit in this fight. But thankfully for Gomes, she's very durable. She's young, 23. She hasn't taken a ton of damage in her career. She's only had 10 professional fights, so she's still able to eat some of these shots. Now, she does have a ton of power, though, on her own side, whether it's the heavy kicks or just the power in the hands. The girl hits like a truck, and that's what she needs to win a lot of fights. Grappling. She's got decent takedowns, but she can be held down if she is taken down. Now, I understand Angela Hill isn't going to be going for a lot of takedowns, so that might benefit Gomes to not have to really worry too much about this. But then again, Loma Lukwumi took her down, and she's not really a grappler either. She's a Muay Thai specialist. So it can happen when you know strikers are starting to feel the pressure from Gomes. They say, you know what? I need to take this girl down and mix this up. That can happen. She's extremely aggressive, though, and that's something to take note of because, you know what? We're going to cover that in a minute. Let's break down Angela Hill first. Okay, solid Muay Thai. As far as skill for skill in the striking, Angela Hill is much better. She's got fantastic volume, excellent movement on the feet. She puts together beautiful combinations. The problem is she doesn't have a ton of power. Angela Hill isn't stopping you with her shots. There is no stopping power on those strikes. So when you got Gomes coming forward getting ready to land her big power shots and she's eating a couple of shots just like that, letting her head bounce around a little bit, she's walking through those because Angela Hill doesn't have a lot of power. What she needs to do is land volume and move in order to get away from someone like Gomes who's just going to be trying to walk forward and eat the shots to throw her shots. That's going to be the, the give and take here. Does Angela Hill just keep moving and getting the, the strikes off and win that way? Or does Gomes just weather the storm, come through and start landing her shots? Now, for Hill, she got good takedown defense if Gomes is getting hit a lot and she starts shooting for takedowns. I think she's going to have a hard time taking Angela Hill down. And Angela Hill's cardio is some of the best in the strawweight division. So she's not going to have a ton of luck there. So where do I think this goes? Okay, skill for skill, Angela Hill is the better fighter. She's more polished, more skilled. But the thing you have to account for, my coach used to always tell me this, is he'd say, you can beat fighters that are better than you with the right game plan and the right amount of aggression. Because a lot of times, aggressiveness can beat skill. Angela Hill does not have enough power to stop Gomes. If Gomes can come forward, if she can use that aggressive forward pressure and cut off the cage and not let Angela Hill just keep circling and getting away, it only takes a little while for, for Gomes to get in close and land those big shots. And by golly, is she aggressive. I think we're going to see the younger fighter here in Denise Gomes get the win. I think she's going to be able to land the big shots. She's going to probably get out volumed earlier on, early on, but I do think she's going to be able to get it done. I don't know that she gets the finish over Angela Hill. It's probably not likely, but you can get out volume and drop your opponent multiple times and then win the fight. So for me, I'm going to Nisei Gomes. She's probably going to do the old Cheeto Vera game plan where you get outstruck but still win the fight. That's what she's going to likely do. Gomes for the win. Let me know who you have. I would love to hear from you in the comments below. We have the undefeated Vitor Petrino taking on Modestus Bukowskis in the 205-pound light heavyweight division. And if you haven't seen it already, during the off week, I fixed the light heavyweight rankings. Trust me, they're all over the place. Go to UFC.com and check it out. They're all over the place. And then, when you're done with that, watch my video where I fixed the light heavyweight rankings for the UFC. They can thank me. They can hire me. I'd be okay with that. We'll take care of it from here, guys. Just don't you worry, UFC. Now, 
don't worry. You can watch it at the end of this video. It'll be at the end screen. So don't, 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 don't go jump into it now. It's going to be okay. We're going to break this fight down first. Now, Modestus Bukowskis, 4-1 in his last five, which is impressive because this is a guy who was cut from the UFC after three losses a while back. Now he's back, won some fights on the in-between, and he's back in the UFC. He's 4-1 in his last five. He's fighting Vitor Petrino, who's obviously 5-0 in the last five because he's undefeated. Let's break down Bukowskis first, right? Good striking. He's got good footwork, but he is willing to back up. So although the footwork's nice, he you know, uses it to stay out of the way of some stuff, he is willing to back up in, that, in those instances, and I don't like that a lot. He does have good counters as well, but he drops his hands after the counter, which is strange because then he leaves himself wide open to be countered after his counter. I don't know. It's weird. Um, his volume's kind of low as well. He just doesn't do enough sometimes, but he's got all the skills. He just doesn't put it together quite right. On the grappling, he's decent, hard to take down, hard to hold down. He's got good ground and pound when he gets on top of you. There's a lot of things to like about the skills of Bukowskis. There's just certain things he's not putting together. On the other hand, Vitor Petrino, green as grass, right? This guy's coming in, still learning on the job, but he's doing a good job of picking up just enough skill each fight to be able to get the win. He's a very fast starter. He comes out, tons of power. He's super dangerous in the pocket, but his striking defense is not really there. Hands are down low, gets hit a lot, but... Obviously, it hasn't really cost him yet. Now, his wrestling, it's something he kind of added after he got to the UFC, at least from what we can tell. He's got decent top pressure. He can mix his takedowns in with the strikes of these he big, heavy, powerful shots. Um, his takedown defense isn't the best, but he's also quick to get back up via his taken down. Guys, this one's actually kind of tough for me uh, to pick. I'm going to have to go with Vitor Petrino, and I was confident in it earlier in the week, but I'm getting less confident as the week goes on, and, and not enough to switch the pick. So I'm going to stick with Petrino, but yeah, I don't know. I might just stay away from this one. Kick my feet up on the coffee table, crack open a nice cold root beer, and enjoy this fight as a fan and figure out where we're going to be from then on. Where, where do we see these guys in the division? So Vitor Petrino is the pick. Maybe I'll have to redo those light heavyweight rankings and put him in there somewhere if he keeps getting these wins. Who knows? Let me know who you have in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next one. We have Renat Fakhretdinov. He's taken on Elysio Zaleski Dos Santos. This matchup is interesting because it's another one where we have kind of the young up-and-comer in Fakhradinov taking on the uh, the older grizzled veteran in, in Elysio Zaleski. Zaleski is still getting it done, though. He's older, but he's getting things done. He's 3-2 and two in his last five. He's taking on the 5-0 and oh in the last five Fakhradinov. The level of competition is different, right? Fakhradinov does, does have that good win over Brian Battle in that last five, but there's a bit of an asterisk next to it. I think it was like, what, three days notice or something like that? It was really short notice for Battle. So you have to take that for what it is. The win over Kevin Lee, that's a big name. Was that the Kevin Lee that we, you know, what Kevin Lee was that, right? So this is very impressive, 22-2, and 5-0 and in the last five, but we're still qu not quite sure what his, his ceiling is. Now for Zaleski... Dude's got some sick wins in his career, right? He's got a knockout win over the current middleweight champion in Sean Strickland with a wild head kick. That's fantastic. He's got wins over Benoit Saint-Denis, who is fantastic as well. It's This is a tough fight to predict, and I know a lot of people are just fucking Dean off right away. This is a tough one to predict, so I'm going to break this one down. But really quick, patreon.com slash 138MMA. That's where you can find all my notes. You can find my top five bets of the week. You can find my Patreon parlay. Uh, we crushed it on Invicta last Friday where I found two spots on a five-fight card that I liked. I put them up there. I bet each one individually, and then I parlayed the two together, and guess what? They both hit, so that's fantastic. Guys, that's the kind of stuff you get on Patreon.com slash 138MMA. Anyway, let's break this thing down. Four, we're not Fakhradinov. Solid wrestling, right? He's got good takedown volume. He just comes in, shoots takedowns, tries to get you down. If he doesn't get it down, he's going to use the, he doesn't get you down the first attempt, that is. He's going to try and reap the leg and get you down that way. If he still can't get you, he pushes you up against the cage. He's got a nasty cage push. He's very, very, um, he kind of, he'll grind on you up there, land shots, and just make it suck to be up against the cage. He's going to make you wish that you were on the ground, and then you'll get the takedown from the cage. He's got good uh, ground and pound volume. He doesn't have the, the most violent ground and pound, but he's got a ton of volume to it and, it, and he has pretty good power, so there is that. It's not the most powerful. It's not the most you know um, fight-ending ground and pound, but the volume of it will get the ref to step in if need be. Now, uh, his head position on his takedowns, you've, you've all seen me say it before. I hate it. It's miserable. I don't understand how he's been getting away with takedowns where he literally just ducks his head and runs forward with it and then just... It's horrible. Like, somebody that can wrestle, send this guy, like, a video on how to shoot a double leg. 
I understand he's getting the takedowns, but the what is he doing with it? The why? I don't I don't understand it. Either way, it works for him, so I can't hate on him too much. But I don't know. I don't know. It. I'd be running laps shooting takedowns like that. You know what I mean? Be like, hey, what are you doing shooting a takedown like that? Go run laps. You know what I mean? Like that's I don't know. Decent striking though. He's got power. We saw that in the Kevin Lee fight. It's unpolished. Don't get me wrong. You can tell he's definitely a wrestler first, but the power is there. For Zaleski, dude's a better striker by far. The striking, Zaleski's the better striker. That's there's not nothing to be questioned in that at all. He's got good volume, good power. His kicks are fantastic. And the, the hardest thing to, for uh, opponents of Zaleski is you can't really tell where his kicks are coming from because he comes with that capoeira style and he's able to throw like these spinning kicks and the standard, you know, good old leg kicks, you know, mix up his like traditional martial arts style kicks with like wild kicks that land, like the spin and heel kick to the, jo to the jaw, you know what I mean? He can land that on you out of nowhere. You, don't, you didn't see it coming. So he does have that in his bag of tricks. It does make him seem kind of wild at times, which I do like for certain things. I dislike for others. I like the unpredictableness of it. I don't really like that it's, it's so many big extravagant movements, right? Uh, the knees up the middle are something I do really like a lot because, by golly, that right there. The same thing, every fucking Dino you know, fight... I say the same thing. The guy shoots takedowns with his head like that. I said, knees up the middle by Zaleski. That could be the end of the night for fucking Renino. But in the grappling, Zaleski's no slouch there either. Dude's got good jujitsu. He often catches kicks for the takedown. And it's interesting because fucking Renino will throw this kind of weird like leg kick. It's He opens himself wide open when he throws it too. He'll just kind of put his face like this and he get countered there. But he can also get that leg kick caught by Zaleski and taken down. If he gets taken down by Zaleski... Zaleski's going to be pretty dangerous on top. Uh, he also is quick on leg locks if he gets stuck on the bottom because he'll use them as a sweep, right? He'll go for the leg and get and make you think that he's trying to, you know, get your leg lock. Sure, he'll take it if you give it to him, but he'll also use it to, to because he's pretty darn good in the grappling, to get that sweep by making you react to the leg lock and then he's on top. He's also got decent takedown defense from the standing position as well. Zaleski's a tough fight for anybody. He's a tough fight for Fakhr Dinov in this matchup. I know everybody's on, on Renat here. I'm not. Darn it. Give me Le Elizio Zaleski dos Santos to get the win and upset another prospect just like he did Benoit Santani. I'm taking him. Zaleski's the pick. I haven't bet him yet. I'm this close. I'm this close. Either way, let me know who you have, and you guys can make fun of me in the comments if I get it wrong. It's totally fine. See you guys in the next one. Daniel fight. Marcos in the Bantamweight division takes on Victor Hugo. These guys, both of them are 5-0 and in their last five fights. This should be a fun fight. Both of them are Contender Series vets. But real quick, hey, if you haven't checked out those live streams I did during the off week, I played a game called World of Mixed Martial Arts 5. You can get it through the link in the description from Great Dog Software. Use that link. It does help out the channel. It's, you know, appreciated if you do. Uh, thank you guys so much. Also, check out those live streams if you're interested in kind of seeing how the game works, what it is. But otherwise, let's go ahead and break down this fight. So, anyway, Daniel Marcos. Victor Hugo. Let's start on Victor Hugo's side as he's on this side of the board. Dude's got decent striking. Um, he he has a lot of good and a, and a few things that are not as good. So the good comes forward with a ton of power. The bad, he loops a lot of stuff. He gets kind of like open for counters because he throws a bunch of hooks and overhands. And when you're fighting guys that are a little bit better in the strike, a little more polished, that can leave you open. However, if he hits, he hits hard and he uses it to crash the distance and he can get his grappling going with it because he's got good takedowns. And especially good leg locks once he gets the fight to the mat. We saw that on the Contender Series. But he has multiple finishes via some form of a leg lock. Uh, but he is a bit submission over position and can give up position by attacking submissions that aren't necessarily, like leg locks, for example, that aren't necessarily position uh, submissions that you can keep your position on. So there's some good and some bad. He's a very offensive style fighter. On the other side, we have Daniel Marcos. He's more of the stay safe defensive, but yet still obviously land his shots. But he's got a tight defense with a lot of head movement. He's going to use leg kicks. He's going to work the body really well, things like that. He likes to be the counter striker, but he can do it in combination as well, right? So he can throw his combinations while he's getting out of the way of stuff. I like that he does that, but the one thing I don't like about a guy like Marcos is the, the ability or the uh, willingness to move backwards while he's striking. He's willing to back up and counter strike and do things like that. When you got a guy coming forward like Hugo, that can be an issue. But something I do like is his takedown defense. And I think it's going to be able to, he's going to be able to negate the best part of Hugo's game by stopping takedowns. So for me, I'm going to slightly lean Marcos. I liked him better at when we were getting him at like, you know, minus 100 something, you know, uh, in 
pretty much every fight so far. So I can't back him at, at, at the price right now. I I think it's a little too steep, but I do think he gets the win here. I think Hugo has a path to victory, and that's what scares me off the heavy price tag on Marcos. But Marcos is the pick. Let me know who you have, and I will see you Von Feem takes on Vince Pichel. This is the lightweight matchup that we've been waiting for here. This is a fun one. We have the 4-1 Bon Feem taking on the 3-2 and two, uh, Pichel in their last five fights, respectively. Pichel is 40 years old, nearly 41. He's taking on the 27-year-old Bon Feem. Interesting matchup here. Pichel has been around the game a while now. He's been in the UFC for quite some time. He only fights about once a year, so he has been around quite a while, but he's... You know, at 14 and 3 on the career, you're like, man, if he's been around that long, he's not that many fights. In recent memory, he's fought once a year, okay? Um, the dude's got good striking, though. He's got power. Uh, he has eight KOs. It can be deceptive because most of those were quite a bit earlier in his career. He hasn't had a KO in a while, but he does still have the power to drop guys, just not that one shot knockout or anything like that. He's got a pretty good leg kick. It's kind of awkward, but it, it lands pretty well, does damage, so that's what you want. Um, grappling. He is. He is kind of easy to take down, but he'll reverse the position or sweep you as soon as it hits the mat. He's got great scrambles, and if he can get you up against the cage, he can land elbows that are very damaging. So, Pichel has has all the tools of a grizzled veteran, and he's taken on uh, Ismail Bonfim, who, solid striking, tons of power, he's got good combinations, he can counter-strike as well, he's got excellent timing, and that flying knee that he lands is, is absolutely deadly. He catches you with that, you're going to be in trouble. And the way he does it is he backs you up using his power shots, countering you as he moves forward, and then as he gets you back up against the cage, he lands that flying knee. He's done it in quite a few fights so far in his 19 wins. Now, solid jiu-jitsu as well. He's got a large toolbox. I do like that. The ground and pound is absolutely devastating. He looks for the submission from that ground and pound, or he'll just finish you with that. He has good takedown defense, and he makes his opponents pay for shooting takedowns. When they shoot a takedown and fail, he stuffs it and just bombs away with strikes before they can get the chance to start going for that second shot he makes them pay for it but the problem is sometimes he will pull guard i hate when people do that it's not a good idea he will do it occasionally i don't think that's what we're going to see here i think bon Fiend takes this one pretty easily let me know who you have i'll see you guys yeah, in a middleweight matchup between Rodolfo vieira and armin petrosian petrosian four and one in the last five three and two for vieira this is probably the most style versus style fight on the card this is two High-level fighters in their own discipline, and that, that is what they do, right? Armin Petrosian, the high-level kickboxer. It's he's accurate kicks, combinations, good movement. He does keep his hands low, which I don't hate for this matchup particularly because it will help him stop the takedown. But, yeah, the, he is the kickboxer, the fantastic striker here. Takedown defense, eh, he does work to get back to his feet, but the takedown defense isn't the best. It's it's okay, right? It's not, it's not even okay. It's bad. Uh, for Vera... High-level jiu-jitsu. This dude has a massive toolbox on the ground, right? Dude's got decent takedowns, but once he gets into the mat, that's when you're in trouble. He'll use his ground and pound to open up his submissions, but he's going to take your back, and he is a rear naked choke specialist to the letter. If he can get on your back, you're, that's it. You're game over, all right? His striking, decent is being nice. Um, he has a good jab. That's it. He's got a good jab, and he's durable. In the striking, Petrosian all day. In the grappling, Vieira all day. For me... I've gone back and forth on this pick a lot this week, so don't be surprised if I change this one. Keep an eye on the community tab of this channel if you want to see if I do end up changing this. Keep an eye on my Twitter, at 138MMA on Twitter. If I do happen to change it, I will let you guys know. But as of right now, I'm on Rodolfo Vieira. That is the pick for the fight. I'm probably not going to bet this one. This is, this is one of them fights you kick your feet up on the coffee table, crack open an ice cold root beer and toss it back because we're a couple of root beers deep in this one already here. Now, Pierre is a pick. Let me know who you have, though. I will see you guys in the next Matchup fight. next, Kyo Bohayo takes on Abu Smagomedov. Both of these guys have had some, some hype around them at one point in their career. Megamedov kind of lost a lot of his in that last matchup when he fought Sean Strickland. But then Sean Strickland then became the champion, so where do we put him? Now, he's 3-2 and two in his last five fights, 5-0 uh, and oh for Bohayo. For Magomedov, the guy's a really gosh darn good striker, right? He's got that blitzing style. He's got absolutely nasty kicks, plenty of power, and he can strike from either stance. So the striking is all there for Magomedov. He has that. His wrestling is pretty good, too. He can get mixed in the takedowns when he needs a change of pace. But his cardio, glaring weakness. The Strickland fight, sure. Strickland puts a pace on guys. I understand that, but that was quick. That cardio went out quick. And maybe... Just maybe it was because he knew Strickland's going to be trouble over the course of a five-round fight. 
he needed to get it done early because he knew that as the fight drug on, the cardio was going to burn out. So maybe he pushed the pace just a little bit too hard in that matchup in order to try to make that happen earlier. So maybe his cardio burn out earlier in that fight than it would in most fights. I could understand that, but I still think the cardio in this in this fight is going to go to Bahio. Now for Bahio, he's got good striking as well. Not as good as Mega Madoff, but he's got good striking as well. He's got good control over the range. He likes to use his counter shots and he's got good, nice, clean straights, right? The grappling is where he gets his bread buttered, right? Guy's got good takedowns. He works the trips really well if the, if the standard, you know, traditional takedowns don't work. Um, got good control on top. He's an excellent back taker. And when he takes your back, the, your night's over. He's either staying there the rest of the fight or he's looking for that submission. Um, good sweeps from the bottom as well. The grappling edge, Bohio. Striking edge, Magomedov. Both guys are pretty good in the other guy's strength, though. This is a tough fight. It really is. For me, I'm going to have to go with the Brazilian here in Brazil. We're going with Caio Bahio, though. I think it's a tough matchup for him. I, I can see pass to victory for Magomedov, especially on the feet, and that's where the fight starts. But Bahio's my pick. Let me know who you have, and I'll see you Break down this rematch in the heavyweight division. Dante Omiz versus Rodrigo Nascimento. Interesting because it is a rematch, and I don't know anybody that really cares to have this rematch. But I'm going to tell you about channel memberships quick. Nice way to support the channel, $2.99. You click the join button below the video. It basically just helps me get the markers, helps me get you know better audio equipment, visual equipment, things like that. That's what it helps helps me do. And it's a cheap way to support the channel without really investing a lot. You're gonna get a nice little badge next to your name. It's gonna show how long you've been a, a channel member. Um, you get some neat emojis that are exclusive to you channel members. For those that are channel members, thank you so much. The gratitude is, it, is through the roof. I, I want you guys to know that. I, I wish that I could express it better. Thank you guys. That $2.99 goes a long way, even though YouTube does take a little bit of it. But either way, let's break down this heavyweight matchup, the rematch we didn't want. Both guys are 3-1 in a no contest in their last five fights. Dante Mays, he's got decent boxing. He's got power. We saw it in his last fight, unfortunately. Um, dude's got good movement on the feet, but his striking defense isn't the best. He has the tall guy defense. He's a tall guy. That's what happened. He's got a judo background, and he can use a cage push pretty well offensively. Defensively, not as much. He can get stuck against the cage. But offensively, he's got a good cage push. On the other side, Nascimento. Decent decent boxing as well. He's got good forward pressure, and he's got good... He's got decent combos in tight. Like, he's not looking super crisp, but for a heavyweight, he looks good, right? Uh, decent combos in the pocket. Jiu-Jitsu is pretty good once he gets on top of you. He's got good takedown defense as well. Realistically, Nascimento should win this fight. He won the first one, submitted Dante Mays. He probably does the same thing again. I don't know what round. It probably goes just a little bit longer than the last one did. So I'm going to go Nascimento, either late second round sub or early third round sub. Let me know who you have, though. I'll see you, you guys in the next theme, Nicholas Dalby, welterweight matchup in the co-main event of the evening. Guys, if you haven't done it already, this is just a reminder. Like the video. It goes a long way. I appreciate it very much. Let's go ahead and break this down. 4-1 and one in the last five for Dalby. 5-0 and oh for Bonfim. Bonfim is undefeated. Nicholas Dalby, though, 22-4-1 on the career. That is quite impressive. Um, he's 38 years old. He's been around a while, and he's just putting together wins. 4-1 in the last five. That's impressive. 26 on the Bonfim side, so he's younger, hungry, looking to climb the ladder. Dalby's going to be a tough test for anybody, right? He doesn't do anything exceptionally well. Um, he just does things decent, but he does them well enough and consistently enough that he's a hard fight for everybody, as you can tell by that record. Uh, he's got decent striking. Forward pressure's pretty good, volume's pretty good, decent wrestling, decent takedowns, got the cage pushed down. Cardio, pretty good as well. He just kind of does everything well, right? He doesn't do anything poorly. He doesn't do anything, you know, that's going to cost him big time. He just, decent fundamentals, and he just puts it together well. But he's going up against Gabriel Bonfim, who is absolutely fantastic on the feet, solid boxing, forward pressure's there, hand speed is there, combinations is there. He's got he's got good counter striking as well. The one problem is he can be hit when he's fully at range. What do I mean by that? Like I'm not talking like in the pocket throwing shots. No, striking defense is pretty good there. Fully at range before anybody does anything. You're you're at full distance. That's when his his striking defense is usually the most lax, which is strange. But uh jiu-jitsu wise, dude's got a large toolbox. He's absolutely Super positionally sound. He's not just giving up positions. He will jump on a guillotine here and there, but he gets the guillotine. So it's it hasn't really come back to bite him. He's got a nasty guillotine. He's just quick on submissions, whether it be that guillotine, like I mentioned, or any of the others. Dude's quick to work. He's a fantastic fighter. I got to take Gabriel Bonfim here. 
But Nicholas Dalby, just something about this guy. He just wins fights. 22-4-1. When you think of Nicholas Dalby, you don't think of a record like that. Like, you know, you think, like, oh, yeah, he's a middle-of-the-road kind of guy. But that's a that's a top-tier record. I understand the level of competition isn't, like, super high, but he's got wins over guys that are pretty good. So I'm taking Gabriel Bonfim. Let me know who you have. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Let's move right along. All right, here it is, the main event of the evening. And I won't tell you again. Get down there, like this video. Let's break down this fight. Jalton Almeida, Derek Lewis. Now, we understand Curtis Blades was supposed to be in this matchup. Derek Lewis, who beat Curtis Blades, is stepping in, taking this fight. Not on super short notice, but short-ish. Uh, Derek Lewis, he's 2-3 and three in the last five. He was on a bit of a, uh, a rough patch for a while there, but uh, got a win in his last fight. Looked impressive. Dude had, uh, you know, not quite a six-pack, but he had abs showing through in his last matchup. Derek Lewis... Looked fantastic there. He's fighting Jalton Omeda, who's looked fantastic in the the entire time he's been in the UFC. Running right through everybody. He's 19-2 and on his career. Those two losses are from a long time ago. 5-0 and in the last five. Let's break this one down. Derek Lewis. Dude's got good striking. Uh, he's got a ton of power. We know that. He keeps his, his power late. Dude has the most knockouts in the UFC. He's got a, what is it, like 22 knockouts in his career. He's got a lot of knockouts in the career. It might be 22. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. Uh, but either way. Tons of knockouts for Derek Lewis. Got great timing on those shots. He can counter strike with the best of them. But the deal is, his, he throws a lot of single shots. And if it doesn't hit, well, then he's in trouble. Especially in this match where he's fighting a guy that, like Jalton Mameda who's going to try and take him down. He does have the ability to time those takedowns. We saw him do that against Curtis Blades, the guy who's replacing in this matchup. But there's that. When you do take him down, he is difficult to hold down. He does have an initial pop back up kind of effect to him. He's a freakishly athletic guy for someone who is as big as he is. So Derek Lewis does have a lot of upside in, in a lot of matchups. But Jal Nomade is a beast. This guy is, has a high motor. He's got solid takedowns. When he gets on top, he's got excellent control, brutal ground and pound, and he's going to attack submissions. We don't really know a ton about his striking. He doesn't get hit because, you know, whatever he's... He's shown very little striking at the UFC level. He's done some, but very little. So not enough to really go into depth on. Kind of like Derek Lewis is grappling. There's just not really, like, he's not offensively trying to grapple very often, right? So it's the striking of Lewis. If it stays on the feet and he's able to land bombs, Almeida's in trouble. If Almeida gets a hold of him, which he likely will, Derek Lewis is in trouble. You got to take Jalen Almeida. But you also have to understand that Derek Lewis could just flatten him in the first round. If you bet this fight to end in the first round, that's probably a decent bet, right? I don't know what the odds are, but that's, I mean, likely, isn't it? The under's probably horrible. I assume this fight ends early. So that's where I'm at. Jalton Almeida is the pick. Let me know who you have. Thank you guys for watching. I will see you in the next one. But don't forget to check out how I fixed the light heavyweight division for the UFC. I fixed the rankings. The rankings were all over the place. I put a rational spin on it, made the rankings look good. You can find it right here. It's probably already up on the screen. See you guys soon.